I want to speak to you just very briefly <laughs> um, about resurrecting hope and reasons to believe again. Now, hope is a very important thing to have in your life. Two th important things to have is hope and faith, faith and hope. One of my bishops years ago said that it's, it's better for a man to be without arms and legs than to be without hope. Losing hope is one of the most devastating things that can happen to a person. Now, over the last few years, so much has happened, and a lot of people have lost hope. And so it's important that we, and my role today, is to underscore just exactly why we're having all this jubilation, all this fanfare, this celebration. Is it partly just what church people do? Is it we come to church on Easter and have a great time? Or is there something more than that? So I particularly want to speak to those of you who are on the more the skeptical margin. You, you're here, but you're not really too much into it. I want to, once again, just rehearse the, the scripture that was read. And it says that, I want to read this particular part where it says, about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, he was a prophet, powerful, in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped. Say that with me. But we had hope. When Jesus was crucified, it was a massive anticlimax for a lot of people. You think about the time in Israel when they longed for a savior. They longed for someone that would come alongside Someone that would be the, the Messiah to take them away from this situation of being occupied Israel. Not just that, but it was prophesied that Israel would be a blessing. And there they were, Israel, a nation under siege. And so there was this hope that a Messiah would come and he would redeem Israel. And Israel would once again be at the place where uh, it's God's people a place of pride. And for many years, they've been in bondage in Egypt, in Babylon, in many other places. And so when Jesus came on the scene, he fit the bill perfectly. He was a miracle worker. He challenged the authorities. He called to himself disciples, and they all were people who were just regular people, but doing extraordinary things. And last week we talked about the, the Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And so instead of all of this great things that would happen, instead Jesus was crucified like a criminal. Far from being a prince, a king, he was crucified. And so we, we followed this story and Luke allows us to to eavesdrop on a conversation with a, a number of people, two men. One of them we know his name, but for the other person, I want you to put your name there. They didn't even wait for the fanfare to finish, but they, when they heard and knew that Jesus was crucified, they left Jerusalem, and they were walking home delusion, despondent, because they were there when Jesus did the miracles. They were there when Jesus was challenging the Pharisees. I believe those two men were there when Jesus was triumphantly entering Jerusalem. I believe they were there at the house of Lazarus when they saw that when Jesus raised Lazarus for the dead, they were all in. And so when the, t the news went around that this was the Passover where Jesus was going to make his move. You know, the disciples leaked it online that this was going to be the time. 
And so they went to Jerusalem with great expectation and recognizing that God would redeem them at this point. This was a time, because a lot of the time Jesus did say, don't tell anyone that I'm the Messiah. Don't tell anyone that I healed you. But this was the time that Jesus was going to go public. And everybody was so excited. This was a time that we who were occupied, we were being denied our rightful place. Finally, people are going to know that we have a Messiah. And so there was great expectation, and instead of Jesus challenging the Romans and challenging the, the, the high priest, Jesus was quiet, defeated, and crucified. And so after this anticlimax, two of the people were going home, despondent. Like many of us over the past few years, we've lost people. They were going home. And Jesus, they didn't know who it was, was walking beside them. And Jesus said, what are you talking about? And they said, what, what do you mean what we're talking about? Have you not heard? It's been everywhere. Where have you been? It's been on Facebook. It's been on Instagram, TikTok, CNN, NSBC. It's been on Fox. It's been everywhere. That Jesus, the prophet, was completely humiliated and crucified. Jesus was the one that we had hoped. Three things that I noticed that Jesus did when he was dealing with these people who were facing shattered hopes and dreams. The first thing he did was he came alongside them. And, you know, and he listened to their stories. Notice that Jesus came alongside them and listened to them. Secondly, he, he dwelled and abide with them. And we read about this when Jesus, when they said, when they reached their place, Jesus said, okay, I know that we're in Emmaus. And the word Emmaus actually means, for some people, in some translation, the end of the road. Have you ever been to the end of the road? We've believed, we've trusted, we've been to the doctor, we've been, to, we've been everywhere. <sighs> but now I'm at the end of the road. I'm at Emmaus. And Jesus sat with them at Emmaus, the end of the road. And the Bible then says to us that only when Jesus was serving the bread, when Jesus broke the bread and they saw his nails, scarred hands, that they realize that Jesus was the Messiah. Hallelujah. And then they ran back to Israel, they ran back to church. When you get find hope, come back to church. If you want to, if you want to dwell in hope, come back to church. Many of you have taken a hiatus. Come home. They went back to church and they told the disciples that Jesus is risen. Somebody put your hands together for the Lord. Now, when Jesus was crucified, 33 AD, there were only about 120 committed followers. Just 120. Today, there are 2.3 billion Christians in the world. Christianity is by far the largest organization in the world. The church is bigger than China. As a matter of fact, the church is bigger than China and Europe put together. As a matter of fact, the church is bigger than China, Europe, and America put together. 
There are, there, are, there are people who are Christians from everywhere. You can go anywhere in the world. Bangladesh, Pakistan, Iraq, Iran. You will always find Christians in America, in Australia, all over the world. Christians are there. Christians are everywhere. The church is the biggest organization in the world. Now, how did just a band of 12 poor people who follow Jesus, how did just a few people, they couldn't go viral because they didn't have internet. They were just in a village somewhere. Far from many of the capitals of the world. How is it that this activity with 12 people mushroomed into a movement of 2.3 billion people? And there was only one word, the resurrection. The resurrection. Christ suffered, he died, and he rose again. There are many religious leaders around the world. Great leaders. Great teachers. But one thing they all have in common is that they all died. You can go and see in Israel... Moses was buried at Mount Nebo. Buddha is buried at the, the, uh, the sanctuary of Kushanga in India. And you can go there and it would say, here lies the great Buddha. You can go to Saudi Arabia and you can go to the Hajj. You can, you, you can actually go to, the, to, to Mecca and you will see a, an inscription here lies Muhammad, the prophet of God. You can go to the tomb of Confucius, and I even went there when we went to China. You can go there and he would say, here lies the tomb of Confucius. You can go to uh, Afghanistan, and, there, and, and, and Zoroaster was a great leader in his time. But you can go there and you can go to Balkh and it will say, here lies in this wonderful edifice the tomb of Doriaster. You can go to uh, India and go to the west bank of the river, uh, Ravi River uh, in Punjab and you can see the great teacher, Guru Nanak, who had a lot of influence over people in Pakistan. You can go to uh, Massachusetts and it will say here lies Mary Baker Hedy you can even go to Illinois and it will say the, gr the grave of Joseph Smith founder of Mormonism and if you dig him up you can find his bones but I was curious whether or not it was true that Jesus literally rose from the dead. So I went to Israel. And I wasn't interested in to go anywhere else. I wanted to go, because I've been to many of these other places. And I've seen their tombs. And I've seen tombs of great people, great leaders. But when I went to Israel, I said, take me to one place. I want to go to the tomb of the Holy Sepulchre. And when they took me there, I looked inside the tomb. I looked on the wall and there was no inscription that said, here lies. Because Jesus died. Jesus was buried. But on the third day, Somebody say, on the third day. On the third day, he rose again. Now, now, now I'm not talking about resuscitation. Because I know that there are many people who have great 
uh, testimonies of being or, or, or being dead for, uh, for, for, for 30 minutes and 15 minutes. I'm not talking about your heart stopped beating after 30 minutes. I'm talking about someone who was dead on the cross, verified dead, taken down, taken to the tomb. The funeral happened. Everybody's gone home. And on Saturday is taking place. The disciples have gone. And he is completely and utterly dead. And he's been dead four days. And I'm saying that that same Jesus who was dead somehow rose from the dead and was seen by over 500 people. The resurrection of Jesus is singularly the most important reality in this world. And I could tell you that most Bible scholars, even the skeptical ones, I don't have time to go into it, all attest to the testimony Roman soldiers historians Josephus many of them that Jesus Christ was seen after his death now now the fact that Jesus is the only person in the world who died and rose again means that there is hope for the world. I want to just give you seven reasons for resurrection hope. Seven reasons. It's in your notes. For those of you who are going to be here, come out next year, this time. <laughs> Put it there for you. You can read it next Sunday. Firstly, the resurrection of Jesus is the triumph over death. Now, let me tell you, death, and I've buried a lot of people. Death is a fearful thing. If you've never thought about death, you never thought about dying, and then the doctor tells you, I'm sorry, you've got cancer, and it's stage four, and you've got six months to live. You begin to wonder, what's going to happen? You're too busy living to think about dying. But now you'll be thinking, what, what's going to happen? And as death gets closer and closer and you feel unprepared, I've seen strong men weep. I've seen men cry out because they're unprepared. But you see, the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus is the triumph over death. That no matter what you face, you don't need to worry what's going to happen to you after you die. Now, now, one of the most dreadful things that we fear in life, what's the, most, what's the ultimate thing we fear in life? What's the, most, what's the ultimate thing you fear? Not fear, but what's the ultimate, the, the worst thing that could happen to a person in some cases? Is that you die. Jesus died so that you can have triumph over death. And I love that song. What, what was that song? Grave. What was that song you sang? The second, the second to last song. Yes, you got it. I'm running out of the grave. You see, you see, the, you see the death of Christ means that you don't have to fear anything. No matter what you're facing, if you can face death and God has given you the power and the grace, you can face anything in your life. And we give praise to God. Number two, it's the fulfillment of prophecy. The, 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 the resurrection of Christ was something that was prophesied. I haven't got time to go through the scriptures with you, but it was prophesied thousands of years before. And it happened just at the time. And there's a lot of people that were said, and a lot of people have been studying this thing, but the resurrection of Christ was the fulfillment of prophecy. It was something that was foretold many years before. You can read about it in the Psalms. You can read about it in Isaiah. You can read about it in, in, in Ose and many other texts. That I, don't, I don't have room to put on here. But it's the resurrection of Jesus is the fulfillment of prophecy. Number three, transformation of lives. That your life can be transformed. 
Jesus rose from the dead so that your life can be transformed. No matter whether you are hooked on drugs, whether you are, you, you are facing sickness, no whether you, are, you come from a life that has been, been so difficult and a life that you have struggled, the fact that Jesus rose from the dead means you can rise from anything. You can rise from sickness, you can rise from defeat, you can rise from bankruptcy. And I want to talk to somebody today who can testify that Jesus Christ transformed my life. Do I have any witnesses? here today that Jesus Christ transformed my life. No matter who you are, you can be, your life can be transformed. The Bible says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, look at somebody and say, I am the anyone. If anyone is in Christ, uh, hallelujah, the, the, that person, if anyone is be in Christ, he's a new creation. Hallelujah. The old have passed away and all things have become new. Somebody put your hands together for the life of Christ that he gives to us. Thirdly, it defeats sin. We were therefore buried with him. Sin can have a control of our lives. Darkness. Sin can have command of our lives. Many people would love to come to church, but there are certain things they can't let go of. Secret things that I just can't let it go. Behaviors that if you continue, it will mushroom and become bigger than you can control. But I'm here to say that the resurrection means that you can overcome anything in your life that you find difficult. Because Jesus rose from the dead. And when you identify with Jesus... And some of you here today, I want you to know that whatever your situation, whatever your challenge, you can be victorious because Jesus rose from the dead. If I'm here, let somebody testify that Jesus rose from the dead. Hallelujah to the Lord for that. Amen. It also gives the assurance of salvation. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now let me tell you this, friends. There has been no other provision for you. I don't care who you are. When it comes to pleasing God and having life eternal and, and having hope the only provision there is, is in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you can know you're saved. And your knowledge of salvation is not just platonic, it's not just intellectual. When God is able to place within your spirit an assurance that you are loved and an assurance that you are his. And you may not have a degree in theology. You may not have a PhD in homiletics or soteriology, but you know. Like the old mothers you say, I don't know how I know, but I know. Come hell or high water. That's the canon. And you know, with that knowledge, you cannot talk them out of it. You could be skilled in philosophy. You could tell them how you've read Dawkins' book about the God delusion. But they will still look at you and say, I know. Well, what a wonderful thing to have. An assurance of salvation. That I know that I'm saved. I know that I'm saved. I can look death in the face and not be afraid. I know I'm saved because therefore nothing I can face in my life can overcome me. Nothing is too big because I know I have been saved by the blood of Jesus and I've rose from the dead. I've, and this, is what the, this is what this is about. The resurrection of Jesus means that you can rise Come on, somebody. You can rise. Whatever is holding you back. 
Whatever is keeping you down. Whatever is tying you to the, the, the pole of stagnation. Whatever is keeping you. The resurrection of Jesus is the fact that God has given you the power to rise up. To rise up. You've been trying everything else. You tried so many things, but why don't you try Jesus? God will give you the power. And I've seen prostitutes rise up. I've seen gangsters rise up. I've seen people who have been in prison for 25 and 30 years rise up because of Jesus Christ. Is there anybody here today that I can rise up? Come on, rise up from your problem. Pull them out of your sins. Come out from your struggle. Rise up from your depression. Rise up from your addiction you can rise look at somebody and say you can rise rise up rise up come on somebody rise up your family is trying to push you down poverty is trying to push you down bills are trying to push you down but you can say I am a resurrected saint I can rise up come on pull on somebody's hand and say come on rise up rise up Rise up. Hallelujah. Everything in life, you may be seated, is trying to pull us down. But you can rise up. Hallelujah. 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 Let me tell you, friends. Life can be hard. Things can happen. I've lost members of my family this year face challenges and things make you want to just give up and, and just abandon hope and there's a difference between faith and hope faith you can trust it many of you have faith but you've lost hope you believe that Jesus I know you're going to keep me I know you're going to protect me but you don't know for sure how it's going to end up you see, hope is saying, no matter what hell I go through, I know at the end of it, I'm going to be all right. Many of you have said so many times, like the men on the Emmaus Road, I went to the doctor and he said he had a treatment and I had hoped, I had hoped. I was trying to have reconciliation with my husband and I had hoped but nonetheless I'm facing divorce. I went to the bank and I realized I'm almost bankrupt. I had hope. My boss came to see me and told me that I'm going to be laid off and I had hoped. You see, this is where the resurrection comes. Because there are some powers you need to pull you up that is not around you. It's not in your family. It's not in your history. It's not in this world. And God has given you power to appeal to a greater power to pull you out of addiction. Pull you out of stronghold. And so when you say, we had hoped. That's the story of many of us. Shattered hopes. But this is one thing you can put your trust in. There's one thing that you can hope on. And that Christ died. Christ was buried. And he rose again. Say it with me. He died. He was buried. And he rose again. Say it with me. He died. He was buried and he rose again. Look at somebody and say, he rose again. He rose again. And because he rose, come on, say it with me. Because he rose, I can rise. I can rise. I can rise from all my challenges. I can rise from, come on, talk to me now, from all my defeat. reasons to believe again I want you to bow your heads at this time
I want to pray for three things today. Some of you here, if you take a step, it will make a difference in your life. As a young man, I went to a church service. My whole life was surrounded around playing basketball and becoming a professional basketball player. But God called me. And I responded. And I thank God. And you know what? It was just a service like this one. But if you say yes to Jesus, no matter what your situation is, no matter what, you don't have to fix yourself up. Jesus says, come as you are. You don't have to clean yourself up. Jesus says, come as you are. Jesus can deal with the as you are. Your friends may not be able to, your family, but Jesus can deal with it. I want the worship team to get ready. But I want to pray for three things. First thing, if you're here today, you say, Pastor, I'm not a believer. I want to be honest, I'm not a believer. But I want you to pray for me. Because I need Jesus in my life. Is there anyone we can pray for? Pastor, pray for, pray for me. I won't even call you out. Just raise your hands. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm gonna, where's the prayer warriors? I'm going to ask the prayer warriors to come. Come on, we're going to pray for you. Raise your hand. There's a lady right there. Just pray for her over there. Anybody else? Pastor, pray for me. Make sure I'm not missing anyone. I need the resurrected Christ in my life. You tried everything else. It's time to try Jesus. Anybody else here? Lift up your hands high so I can see them. It's one over there. Can somebody just pray for that young lady right there? Anybody else? I believe at least two more people are here today. Hallelujah. I want to say, just to pray. And if you're in the overflow, somebody just go in the overflow to make sure there's nobody there. My second prayer are for those of you that you've been pressed down, you've been pressed. Things have been pressing you down, just trying to, you, you feel like the, the, the men on the Emmaus Road, you had hope, but things have been pressing down and, and you're struggling. I want to do what Jesus did. Jesus came alongside you. And if I'm speaking to you in this resurrection Sunday morning, you say, Pastor, I'm here, but I'm losing hope, I'm losing faith. I need prayer. I want you to put your hands up. Be honest. Be transparent. Put up your hands right now. I want to pray for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you, hello? Do you mind? What's her name? Do you mind coming out? You know, you're not afraid to come out. Put your hands together for her. She comes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Where's the prayer warriors? I'm going to ask. Joanne, can you come? Just face me. Anybody else? We're going to pray for you. Anybody else want to bow your heads right now? We want to pray for you. Hallelujah. Things have been pressing you down. Things have been difficult in your life. And you want prayer on this Resurrection Sunday. I want you to just lift up your hands right now. Lift up your hands. Hallelujah, Jesus. Come. Harriet, come. We want to pray for you. You've been through so much. It's great to see the Roveners here and the Browns and everyone here today. Put your hands together for them. We love them. Hallelujah. Come. I'm going to ask the prayer warriors to come back here. Keep your heads bowed. If you need prayer, come. Come forward. 
my last my last call is this if you've been plagued with sickness and you had hoped to be healed you've been to the doctor you've taken the medications and you just cannot be healed I want you to know that there is healing supernatural healing in the power of the resurrection and if that's you whatever you have I want you to run to the altar right now don't allow your fear to hold you back just come now you say pastor I need to be touched you got somebody in your family you need to be touched I want you to come forward come forward right now come right now say pastor I need prayer many times it's our, it's our doubt that is holding us back come wherever you are come come we want to pray for you we want to pray for you worship team whatever your situation is and if you cannot come forward just lift up your hands we're going to come we'll come to you you cannot come forward lift up your hands we're going to come to you you can rise again and so father we thank you today we praise and adore you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come forward. It's okay. If you're here... Yeah, just come through here. Hallelujah. If you're here with someone, a family member, and they are not a Christian or they're just seeking, just lay your hands on them right now. Just lay your hands on the person you, who came with, you came with. Maybe they need healing and they, they don't want to come forward. That's quite okay. Just lay your hands on them. So, Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord, for the resurrected hope we have. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs>